All right, and now it's time for our guest. Paul, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. How's it going for having me here? Other Paul. Yeah, yeah not, not Paul Sutter, but, uh, but our other Paul. Why don't you let people know who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, so my name is Paul Hildebrandt. I'm a uh, film director and space enthusiast, and uh, I'm making a film called First to the Moon about Apollo 8. Wait a minute, what? Uh, so can you give us sort of the background of, I mean, for anyone who doesn't know what happened during Apollo 8, um, what, which, which mission was this? Sure, so Apollo 8, uh, December 21st, 1968, it launched um, carrying Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, and Bill Anders. It was the first, uh, it was a lot of firsts, actually. It was the first launch of uh, the Saturn V with people on it, the full Saturn V, not the 1B. Um, it was, and it was the first mission to the moon, not to land on the moon, but to the moon. So hence the title, first to the moon. Um, and they took, you know, the famous Earthrise photo um, was taken on Apollo 8. And it was the first time that anybody saw the Earth from that distance. Uh, so it was really kind of a game changer for everybody. Uh, and I mean, you know, I mean, for a lot of people who are definitely in the I guess are interested in the in all of the Apollo missions. The Apollo eight was a really big, big milestone. But less people are less. We're less interested in this than, of course, Apollo eleven. Why did you pick Apollo eight as the subject of your of your documentary? Yeah, um, there's a couple reasons. I mean, I've always been interested in Apollo eight because I just feel like it was kind of underappreciated. You know, because Apollo 8 happened and then Apollo 11 and everybody just kind of forgot about Apollo 8. Well, you have to remember that Apollo 8 was, they were, they were the pathfinders. These guys kind of did it first. You know, had they had a limb with them, uh, they could have landed on the moon. But they didn't have a limb. Um, they had a lunar module pilot. In fact, Bill Anders was kind of disappointed that there was going to be no limb on the mission because it wasn't ready. Um, and... Uh, and the second part is, you know, we are we are losing these Apollo astronauts, unfortunately, quite frequently recently. Um, and I felt that, you know, especially with the 50th anniversary of uh, of Apollo 8 this year, that uh, I should interview these guys and, and get this story out there uh, before it's too late. And so who did you get a chance to talk to? So I interviewed all three of the crew, uh, Lovell, Borman and Anders. Um, and they're basically going to be the only interviews in the film. We're not going to be interviewing like Chris Craft or, you know, Gene Kranz or anybody, any of those guys or the wives or anything like that. It's just them telling their own story, their experiences, um, on the way to the moon and back. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, so much of what we do as, as journalists is we just look at what's out there on the internet and we go through the same material again and again and again and all of the archival stuff and whatever pops up in the Google image search and so on. Getting a chance to actually talk with them, what new information do you feel like you're going to be able to present that maybe people aren't, aren't familiar with? Yeah. Um, well, they are, they are exciting people. I mean, they are really one of a kind. And uh, when you talk to them, they each have their own, each have their own perspective, which I feel hasn't really been explored as much. Yes, there's been a couple of movies made about Apollo 8, but I, I feel like it's their individual viewpoints on the mission and its goals and what they accomplished and, and how they viewed the space race hasn't really been seen before. And uh, we're also going to do, the film was also going to do their whole story, their life story. Which, which has not been told, uh, at least on film. There's been a couple of books that have kind of halfway gotten there, but uh, never been done on film. So uh, we're really going to tell the whole story of these, of these guys. Uh, come on, like just a couple of spoilers? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's, uh, there's you know, it's, it's an Apollo mission. Um, what we're doing with the, the real spoiler, I guess, is what we're going to do with the film. And that is... Um, we're really going to go kind of kind of really crazy with the animation and we're going to make this try try to make this more of a uh, an immersive film uh almost like a 2001 or something you might see in a planetarium show where where you can feel like you're on the journey with them so there's going to be a lot of sort of really epic space scenes um 
and we're gonna we're gonna go overboard with the music and try to make it really really great i mean I just wrapped up, I mentioned this a couple of times, I just finished reading Endurance, which was Scott Kelly's biography and sort of his telling of what it was like to be on board the International Space Station for a year and the tests that they got a chance to, to undergo. And one of the things that I really wasn't expecting was just how much detail he went into his career and his thought process. It's actually a really candid book. So did you kind of get that that deep with him as well to kind of get to that level of of candor i mean you know our every time i've met an astronaut i'm just always amazed at how they are just these pinnacles of human beings you know they they're they're fearless test pilots and uh you know they have all these these abilities and knowledge and backgrounds and doctorates and things like that and yet of course obviously every one of them built up so did you, you know, in getting a chance to actually talk to them and kind of dig, were you able to really kind of get that next level story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, one, one, one thing that really struck me is just how, how, how military these guys are. You know, everybody thinks of astronauts as sort of these ambassadors into space, uh, but uh, these guys are soldiers, um, especially Bill Anders and Frank Borman, these guys were like, you know, we're, we're in this to beat the Russians. We don't really care about anything else. You know, <laughs> that's why they did it. Um, and like the, the top, you know, I'm assuming most, most of everybody watching has seen Top Gun. Are you assuming you've seen Top Gun, Frazier? Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, he goes, he goes into the jet and he goes inverted, right? And he, he flips off the, the Russian pilot. Well, Bill Anders actually did that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So that's one of the stories that we're gonna, and we haven't quite figured out how to tell that in the film yet, but we've got it on, on camera. So, uh, and there's a lot of really crazy stories like that about what these guys did and what they went through in their in their military career. And it's it's. I mean, it's how do they feel? I guess I don't. And again, I you know, I guess we'll have to find out. But just sort of the state of space exploration after the Apollo era, after their work had been had been done do they have any kind of perspective for for you i did i did ask them about that um you know coming from my last film which was all about that um they are they're generally disappointed um yeah. in you know especially jim lovell jim lovell is a huge advocate for returning back to the moon and, and pushing out there further um you know nasa has has waned in its uh, in its human exploration of space, you know, since uh, since the Apollo program. I think I think they'd all would like to see it do better. Uh, question from Nancy uh, saying, you know, for using new animations and newly found archival footage, who did the animations, and where do you get your hands on the archival footage? Yeah, well, the animations we haven't done yet, um, so that's why we're actually running a Kickstarter right now because we're trying to get the film funded. That's so we can hire an awesome animator and get these animations done. There's an animation in the trailer that I made, but it's not good. So it's not going to be any representative of what's going to be actually in the film. That's just something I made in After Effects. Um, uh, the archival footage, I've already been to the National Archives and researched a bunch of stuff for this project. So I've got, you know, I've got pages of, of notes. These are all, these are all films, um, all individual film reels. Um, that we need to have scanned, huge cost to have those scanned. Um, and it's all, I mean, I was actually very fortunate because when we were there, I was able to talk to one of the archivists that kind of, they hide in the back of the National Archives. They don't really come out and talk to people very much. And he came out and he said, hey, I just finished cataloging all this stuff on Apollo 8. And uh, would you like a list of this stuff? And I said, yes, we'd like all of it. So there's a bunch of film reels about Apollo 8 that have never been scanned. Training films, launch footage, engineering wow. footage, um, you know, the construction of the spacecraft itself, all kinds of different launch angles of the of the flight. Um, you know, just tons of material. How uh, some people are, are mentioning in, in the comments, just sort of your level of contact with these astronauts and the various people and as well as the people that you worked with in your in your previous movie what's your process for for getting access to these people um i just email them yeah 
you know, just say, uh, Hey, you know, making a movie. Yeah. Uh, some of them have, uh, assistants. Um, Frank Borman was, was really funny cause, uh, I got his email from, uh, um, from another contact and, uh, I emailed him and he just calls me the next morning. He's like, Hey, this is Frank Borman. I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> <You know? laughs> how's it going? Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, he lives in Montana and just kind of hangs out up there, takes care of his wife. And, uh, Bill Anders is in Washington and he has a, a really great air museum, uh, that he, that he runs and he still flies. And Jim Lovell is, is out in Chicago, um, doing all kinds of doing all kinds of stuff. So let's talk a bit about the Kickstarter then. So how does this all how's this all going to play out now over the next coming weeks, months, years? Yeah. So this is the plan. Uh, we have the Kickstarter up now. I, I don't I don't know how many days are left. Twenty something days left. Um, we need to raise a hundred thousand dollars, and that goes to mostly the huge, the big expenses here are archival footage and music um, as well as the animation. Those are the three big ones. The other money will go towards legal fees, distribution, marketing, boring stuff like that. Um, so we need to raise that money to get the film made and the plan is to have it done by the end of this year so we can have it out in time for the 50th anniversary of the flight. Um, ambitious goal but this is this is a much simpler film than what i had, uh, what i had made before fight for space involved 50 plus interviews we're trying to find this story find the answer to how we're going to fix our space program this story you know we have the interviews you know these guys have told their story we just need the footage put it together and create this really exciting film uh so we're asking uh for people to help us by donating and sharing the campaign uh, so we can get it funded. I'd, I'd be interested to sort of hear your experience on what it's been like to attempt to sort of create and distribute a, a documentary in this new age of sort of decentralized media. You know, how did the experience go with Fight for Space? I mean, it almost sounds like you learned a really powerful life lesson was to simplify, <laughs> simplify, simplify, and tell one much simpler, more direct uh, story, but also just you know, how did the response go? How did it all work out for you? Cause I mean, we talked to you must've been a couple of years ago last time mm -hmm. about the fight for space. So how did it all kind of work out? Yeah. Yeah. Well, fight for space, uh, it was, uh, you know, I had this sort of grandiose idea that we were going to make this film about how great NASA was. And, um, as I talked to more people and as NASA sort of pushed us away, because I was asking questions like, why don't we have a more ambitious space program? Well, they didn't like me asking that question because uh, it made them look bad. So we, uh, I, we had to interview a lot more people. We had to get into sort of the new space crowd, um, talk to them about what they thought the future was. Um, went to all kinds of conferences, huge project. Um, so trying to find that story took a lot longer than I thought it would. But I think what we eventually made, uh, you know, it turned out to be a decent film and we got picked up by Gravitas Ventures. Um, and they're a decent sized distribution company. Uh, they do a lot of documentary films. They did a big one called Sound City a couple of years ago. If you're into, you know, rock music, they did the one called Last Man on the Moon about Gene Cernan, recently Mission Control. A mm -hmm. um, lot, of, lot of great films and, uh, and they, they picked up ours and put it out there. So we got a, we got a 10 city theatrical run um, and it's, it's out there on Amazon Prime now. And you can watch it if you're a Prime subscriber. Perfect. All right. So how do people get involved in the Kickstarter and, and help make this happen? Yeah. So uh, uh, we have a website, firstmoonmovie.com. There's a link right on the front page to Kickstarter. Go there, click on it, and uh, help out the campaign. And uh, additionally, share that Kickstarter link uh, with everybody. And... Uh, well, right so, now we're what twenty one days to go. You're at twenty five k out of the hundred thousand dollar goal. Mm -hmm. So obviously yeah. you're going to get the weekly space hangout boost, but uh, but good but good luck to getting the uh, the amount of money that uh, that you're going to need to be able to finish off this project. I can't wait to see these these interviews with these legends. Sounds amazing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Paul. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, January 24th, 2018. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about Titan sea levels, the increasing Kilanova afterglow. 
are we in the golden age of astronomy or the end of astronomy and the SpaceX uh, static fire and the launch of the Electron rocket? Joining me this week, our regular cast and crew, Dr. Morgan Renberg, the director of scientific presentation of the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. We've also got Dr. Kimberly Cartier, Earth and Space Science reporter for EOS Magazine. Kimberly. Hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day. <laughs> I always feel like there's like some kind of national holiday that I'm missing, but it is just... It isn't. It? It's, a, it's a weekly holiday it's, of space hanging out. If it isn't, it should be. And of course, last but not least, Dr. Paul M. Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State and the host of Ask a Spaceman. Paul. It's me. Other Paul, which just normal Paul. Can I be normal? <laughs> normal freak? Well, the, uh, later on, people are going to hear the guest. It's going to be Paul Hildebrand, and then that's when I'm going to call him other Paul, and you're both other Paul, and then this is what both we Both other Paul. Yeah, Wait a minute. We can't One Paul, two Paul, that's not three Paul, like four. A, there's I'm, like a Paul. Paul one, Paul two. Yeah. Paul Calypse. A Paul so Calypse. Uh, <laughs> Don't steal Calypse. that from me. No. <laughs> <laughs> no pun. Oh, <laughs> what man. have you done? <laughs> All right, we should have more uh, have more more dad jokes on this show. All right, so let's uh, before we get into uh, this week's show, I just want to remind you thank the WSH crew for their continued help, support, production, executive production of this show and they are of course the community go to wshcrew.space they are running the chat they are organizing the guests they are choosing talking about the stories they want and they are just kind of connecting with each other around this show and they are the lifeblood that keeps it all rolling so if you want to be a part of the community you want to take your uh, love the show to the next level join the wsh crew and the, again i want to remind the weird part here is that there's no ownership there's no we don't they are their own separate entity we are a what's the term we're basically their fan club their minions <laughs> yeah we're their fan club we are there we do what they want us to do and it works out well so if you want to really just tell us what to do join the wsh crew and we... there's no greater joy in life than telling fraser what to do <laughs> exactly everyone should get a chance to do this all right let's move on to the to the stories this week first up morgan i want to know about titan sea level yeah this is pretty interesting it's another product coming out of cassini now that the mission is over and this is actually in two parts part one was a new high resolution topography map of titan telling us basically the height of the terrain in various places and it found mountains up to 700 meters high and then another team took that topography map and measured the height of all of the methane lakes and oceans on titan and they found something really interesting and that's that although the smaller lakes on Titan are often at higher elevations, all of the oceans are basically at the same elevation and that that elevation is basically the average elevation on the Titan surface. And on Earth, what we call that average elevation with all the oceans is sea level. And so this, we didn't know that Titan would necessarily have a sea level and now we do. Yeah. And so now from this point on, we can measure all points on Titan at their altitude above and below sea level. That's so crazy. I mean, like... So the... Go ahead, more, Kimberly. Oh, no. I'm just, like, going to express my wonder that there is You're a sea measuring. level on a moon. And it's, like, just like Earth, but it's Titan. And it's made of methane. And, you can talk about... and it's made of methane. And yeah. now you can talk science after I've expressed my wonderment. So uh, is the big deal here... Of course, if you took all the bodies of liquid methane and measured their elevation, and there would be some average number. That's not the exciting part, if I'm understanding correctly. The exciting part is that that average number for the average height of, or the average elevation of these bodies of water is equal to the average elevation of the whole world. Yes, but that's not all the coolness. The, okay. You've sort of overcomplicated it here. All of the big oceans As are at not. the same level. 
So just like here on Earth, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic Ocean are all at the same level, plus or minus tides. Uh, the oceans, the big oceans on Titan are at the same level. And that wasn't, that you might say, obviously, but that wasn't that was actually so something funny. we necessarily would have right. expected because unlike on Earth, all the oceans on Titan aren't touching one another. And so what this tells us is that all of these oceans must be connected underground. Because basically, either you have this incredibly lucky chance that every big body of methane on Titan is at exactly the same level, or they're all connected and thus balancing themselves out in fluid mechanics. And so the hypothesis that this team is suggesting is that just like Earth has aquifers, uh, Titan has aquifers of methane instead of water that are under their surface. But unlike on Earth, these aquifers pay, play a really big role in shaping the global liquid uh, distribution by balancing out all of these big, these big bodies. And it's only these small lakes that are scattered around, not connected to the aquifers, that could be higher or lower than the global sea level. How big so is a big this... thing on Titan? Are we talking backyard pond, Lake Michigan, Atlantic Ocean? So smaller than the Atlantic Ocean, bigger than a backyard pond. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head <laughs> exactly. So they're, they're, they're bigger than the Great Lakes in proportion to Titan, but probably smaller than the Great Lakes in absolute scale. Volume. Okay. It, well, certainly in volume because our best indications are these oceans are probably only a few tens of meters deep in most places. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Not that we, it's difficult to sort of know that in an absolute sense, but a lot of the indirect evidence that we have suggests that the oceans are relatively shallow in comparison to what we would think of an ocean on earth, or what we might think of an underwater ocean at Europa or Enceladus which we could think is like kilometers or hundreds of kilometers deep. So, so does the fact that all of these different oceans and lakes are interacting through groundwater flow, essentially, does that tell us anything about say the, how porous the ground is or any like the composition of the ground? It Under must. I'm not sure that we really ha have taken it to that that level yet. Uh, so the main surface of Titan is made of ice, like regular water ice. And in fact, there's evidence on the surface of volcanism. This is ice volcanism, where liquid water flowing is like lava flowing here on Earth. And so we have evidence that there are these sort of geologic processes going on at the surface, which indicate there must be motion underneath the surface to create volcanoes they don't just appear out of of nowhere but we don't really yet have a good picture of what must be going on and this gives us our first sort of peek into that and says ah there must be not insubstantial connections between these different global oceans it's so weird right it's like you've taken the entire geology of earth and, and hydrology of earth and shifted over one notch so you know instead of a magma rock magma interior you've got potentially some level of, of water ice and some kind of liquid water reservoir underneath and that is the magma that you've got the interactions with with saturn or, that are that are causing the um you know the this material to to break up and come out as as volcanoes of liquid water that are forming rocks of water ice <laughs> with a with a hydrological system which is methane that is falling and raining and rivers and fog it's the craziest place in the solar isn't system isn't it amazing you it's know what we should, extraordinary. we should totally send a drone hopper thing there a nuclear yeah. in a decade who would or so. who would uh should, who would ever someone suggest someone should that. come up with yeah. some plan to do that i did I, did i mention this last week that i'm i'm going to be doing a collaboration with tim dodd and we're going to be taking halves of the argument he got yeah. nuclear helicopter and i got comet mission <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to. I have to dig Short really. Straw there. I'm gonna have to dig really deep. All right. I'm gonna tell you about something, and this is. I don't know if this was like a big surprise, no surprise, uh, but we got 
a rocket today. The Falcon Heavy <gasps> finally did its static test fire. So I'm just going to play this because it's it's oh, really gas. fun. Yeah. I don't know how loud it's going to be. I apologize in advance. about four seconds of pot firing. Pot firing. Yeah, there you go. What is cold firing? <laughs> yeah, so you got a static fire. That's that's on Titan? Yeah, that's on Titan, yeah. <laughs> oh. So they so just to sort of bring you up to speed here, they took the Falcon Heavy rocket, they had been raising it and lowering it and raising it and lowering it and getting prepared to do this static fire test. This is this was the first time that they a fully fueled Falcon rocket. They pumped out, uh, you know, they turned on all 27 Merlin engines and and tested to make sure that they could all fire in concert. And now, the, and this was really one of the big final tests that need to happen before the launch. And now, based on this test, Elon Musk is now saying that we're expecting to see the liftoff of the Falcon Heavy for some time within the next week or so, which is pretty exciting considering wow, how that's long. Crazy. Yeah, considering how long we've been waiting. And and finally, our dream of having a Tesla Roadster going to Mars is is this close. We're about so, we're about okay. to achieve it. So remind me, because this whole saga of SpaceX rockets Sometimes I get lost in it. Remind me, what has been the delay with the Falcon Heavy? What's the big issue? What has been the big issue preventing this from happening like two years ago? Well, the thing with the Falcon Heavy, so on paper, the, what the Falcon Heavy is, is it's three Falcon 9s bolted together. And you've got these three, you know, these three will act in concert, firing all you know, each one has nine engines on board and they will work together. But in reality, it turned out that actually bolting three of these things together caused more stresses and strains and led to new engineering problems that they had not been entirely anticipating. And so it just turned out that getting this thing to a level of operation was far more complicated than anyone had ever planned. And the delays just kept coming and coming. So it's like if you made uh, buses by uh, <laughs> welding together three Astro vans. And four, or or yeah. three buses to side by side and wondering, oh, and wondering yeah. why a, this a thing's good, a little a good harder idea to in, drive. In principle, but you gotta yeah. get all those gas pedals working in, in solidarity. Yeah. Not so easy. And the thing that's really interesting with this, of course, is that, you know, all the separate engines, once the thing has actually launched, they're going to separate and then they're all going to come back and, you know, all the first stages, all three first stages are going to land simultaneously or with, you know, within a short period of each other. Two of them are going to land on land. I think the third is going to be landing out on the barge. And you're going to see, you know, this is going to be unprecedented. They've never had three of these. So, again, we really have to go back to the fact that Musk has said, if this thing doesn't destroy the launch facility, it will be considered a, an amazing success. That's a sort of low bar for success, I gotta say. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he he set a very low bar for success. Oh. Yeah. Well, I hope they pass it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Well, that's a it's a it's a historic um, launch facility. So no, we don't want mm. that thing blowing up and and taking no, out a you. goodly portion of the uh, of the Kennedy Space Center, especially considering the fact that it is a monster of a rocket three fully fueled falcon nines bolted together 27 engines there 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 could be a little mayhem here so uh now of course yeah. you know if this actually works you're going to see in theory you know these falcon heavies are going to be available launches should be available in the 90 million dollar range when you consider that the sls and i think the falcon heavy is going to be able to do 54,000. Uh, kilograms to orbit to low earth orbit when you consider the sls is only going to be a little more than that i think seventy thousand kilograms to 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 leo <clears throat> and it's going to have you know it's going to cost half a billion to a billion dollars per launch in fact i just did a, a video on this the 
individual RS-25 engines on the SLS, which are destroyed on use, each one probably cost about $60 million, which is about the price of a Falcon 9 launch today. should so. just duct tape two Falcon Heavies together and call it an SLS. <laughs> The, yeah, because this, this has worked so well already. The, the equivalent of six city buses. Oh, something about the definition of insanity. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I, I think you're, if you can make three fly together, why not see if you can make six fly together and maybe even nine? Why well, not 12? Why not 20 at that rate? Yeah. Be like the yeah. I think Scott Manley uh, Sorry, has I'm being tried. Sarcastic. Scott Manley's tried this, I'm sure, and has got an answer for us. But. I mean, um, just spec it out in Kerbal Space Program, and if it yeah. works, then it's good to go. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I believe that's how rocket design works. But still, that's I mean... definitely SpaceX's design software. And the, and the big problem with this, uh, with the government shutdown that happened last weekend, I guess we kind of missed it. I mean, we didn't mm. sort of prepare people to, for the, the potential of the government shutdown, and then... The government shutdown came and went over the weekend, but one of the downsides of this was that, you know, SpaceX wouldn't have been able to do their their testing. So glad they were able to do it. Hopefully, they can launch before the next shutdown in a few weeks. <laughs> okay, we've got to what yeah. February 9th? Plan next... ahead, yeah. Musk, please. Yeah, yeah, hurry. Please plan just, ahead. <laughs> just, just just get it in that window. We'll be will be great. Mm -hmm. All right, Kimberly, what have you got for us? Okay, so. I will fully admit that I am not the expert to talk to on this. I was hoping for to bounce some things off of Paul, see if he jumps back in. Yeah, we lost but, him. So if you remember this tiny little event that happened towards the end of last year called a Kilanova, where LIGO uh, observed the gravitational wave signature of two neutron stars colliding, and simultaneously we also obtained lots of images in the electromagnetic spectrum of this same collision and it was dubbed a kilonova and it was the first time we observed gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves coming from the same source uh, and it was a spectacular thing we reported on it for weeks here on weekly space hangout but all the amazing we science that has come out <laughs> well we're talking about it and i'm going to ask you questions about it i mean Paul. we were calling oh. each other phone and going oh my god oh my god kilonova Oh my and God, I Kilanova. was saying, how did you get this number? <laughs> <laughs> Frazier has his ways. Yeah, yeah. He's so all I want, this all I want to talk this about. This thing you might have heard about. Um, people have been studying the afterglow of this Kilanova since, since the event, trying to understand and, and extract as much uh, physics and astrophysics from this event as physically possible. And one of the things that scientists... Uh, observing in x-rays and radio waves have noticed over the past few or the past few months since it's happened is that the uh, afterglow of this collision has actually been brightening instead of dimming away like we would have expected from uh, and like we've seen from things like supernova and nova uh, this kilonova afterglow seems to be getting brighter at least in x-rays and radio waves uh, and so there was a recent paper trying to explain why this would be. Um, and the theory they came up with was that there is a cocoon of hot gas that is surrounding the remnant of this neutron star merger. And the merger event itself released many shock waves that have uh, propagated through the gas uh, and triggered the brightening effect around this brightening glow around the remnant of the collision. So I guess my question to Paul is, do you believe that? Uh, and is that something that is within the realm of known and understood physics? <laughs> uh, that is a really good question. Yes, this is in the realm of known and understood physics. It's not that I necessarily believe it or not believe it. It's a viable hypothesis to explain the observations. The, the fundamental thing here is there is a lot of energy to work with. And initially when it comes to typical supernova explosions or detonations that we see in the universe there's a lot of energy released both kinetically in the motion of gas flying away from the source and electromagnetically in the emission of radiation and maybe some high energy particles etc cetera, etc cetera. and there can be complex interplays where the energy that's released in the motion of the gas surrounding the thing that's blowing up 
can get converted into further follow-on radiation. And one of the examples you already pointed out was the example of a shock wave. So if a shock wave passes through a gas, that is going to heat up the gas in the shock wave. It's going to emit its own kind of radiation. It's going to generate radio waves. It's going to generate x-rays in a process. And one of my favorite words in all of science, which is bremstralung. I know how to spell that. Bremstralung <laughs> is a form of radiation caused by high energy particles moving through a medium. And this can generate x-rays. You can also get strong in the, in the presence of these shock waves, you can get strong magnetic fields generated, which in turn can cause other particles to emit radio waves. So it's totally plausible. Like I can, I can buy it. I can see it. How if you get shock waves, if you get complicated gas physics, you're going to get some extra bonus emission in radios and x-rays. But you know, if we but, hadn't seen the, but if, if we hadn't seen the gravitational waves of this, we would have thought that it was like, but it did get picked up by the, um, by the gamma ray detectors. And so it would have been found as just a regular old boring, uh, gamma ray burst, a short period gamma ray burst. Right. And, but yet to have this afterglow happening, this is unusual, right? I don't honestly know how unusual it is. There are certainly cases of cataclysmic events in our universe that have some unexpected follow-on electromagnetic radiation long after the initial event. That's a very, very generic and broad statement. I don't know when it comes to things like gamma ray bursts, uh, if we see this kind of thing. It could be, it could be that this is a very common thing that happens in gamma ray bursts, in kilonovas in particular, but we usually don't see it because we're not looking in the x-ray, we're not looking in the radio, we're only looking in gamma rays. We say, oh, there's a gamma ray burst, write it down, put it in the notebook, uh, and we don't have this full suite of follow-on observations that we usually have. So in, in your opinion then, what would it take for us to know whether or not this is a regular occurrence and what is actually happening if, there's, if this is you know, regular gas physics? What observations would we need? I would say the more observations, now that we've we've suspected for a while that kilonovas exist, this is this was definitely the, the clincher that helped us know that yes, these things happen, that neutron star mergers happen. Now that we have the electromagnetic signature for one, we don't necessarily need the gravitational waves to, to spot like, oh yes, this one over here, this is another kilonova, that's another kilonova. We can do follow-up observations, we can do multi-messenger observations. Uh, across the electromagnetic spectrum, we can get a handle on it, we can observe more, and to understand the physics, that's where simulations come in, that's where calculations come in, where we experiment with different surrounding media in densities, in distributions, we toss all the relevant physics in, we run the simulation to see what kind of shock waves are produced? Uh, what are the energetics of them? Uh, do they produce the right kind of radiation? And it's that kind of very fundamental matching of simulation to observation that helps us answer these very interesting questions. I mean, being able to have this additional data of the gravitational waves, if, if they can get more of them, then that'll really help pin down the signatures of what were the kinds of objects that came together before the exactly. these kilonova. So more of these observations will really help better classify what's going on. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more gravitational waves, more kilonova. Get on it, more LIGO. Money. Come well, on. But Paul, it doesn't matter because the golden age of astronomy is over. Because the golden age of astronomy is over. We can just hang our hats on the wall and say goodbye. Goodbye? That's it. That's it. No, that's it. This is the last episode of the Weekly Space Hangout. Ever. Thanks for joining and, us. And the field of astronomy. And the field of astronomy. We're just done. No, it's this interesting uh, paper that, that came out this week, uh, this article that came out, questioning, and I think it's, a, it's not one of these things where there's a definite answer. It's one of these things where we ought to have this discussion a lot more than we are. And the discussion is, when so much money 
And so many resources get tied up in gigantic missions like the James Webb Space Telescope. Certainly, the James Webb will return, have an enormous scientific return. That's, that's not under question. But what's under question is, well, could we have taken the same amount of money in the same amount of time investment in resource investment and let's play the hypothetical if instead of doing james webb we had done a dozen smaller things or a hundred really small things would we at the end of the day know more about the universe than if we had just stuck to james webb especially with its delays especially with its cost overruns could that money have been more effectively used on multiple smaller projects rather than just giant ones? And, and James Webb here is just used as an example for the larger point. And the answer is? Uh, well, I don't know. We don't know. But, it's, but this is something we need to talk about as an astronomical community. It's something we need to talk about with the public because it's the taxpayer's money. Are we being responsible with the taxpayer money? when it comes to to choosing our science topics our objectives and our missions and our goals i don't know i'd love to hear from uh, morgan and kimberly i think that many proponents of the james webb space telescope might for example might argue that we've basically done all those little things and that if you want to answer these questions about the very early universe and especially if you want to do those in the infrared, this is the next step. Sure, you could build 10 smaller telescopes, but would you, you know, would you just be sort of filling in the, the details of our view of the universe and not really pushing the boundaries? I'm not sure if I buy that argument, yeah. but I think that's probably a common argument. And you could make the same argument about LSST or the same argument about the 30 meter telescope, you know, 20 two meter telescopes don't equal one 40 meter telescope. I mean, I had a chance to, to talk with you Mike need that. Brown about this, you know, the, the Pluto killer, Mike Brown. And he said, you know, I asked him like, are you, you know, do you think there's going to be any more Kuiper belt objects that you're going to be finding? And he said, no, no. I think with the current round of telescopes, we have reached the limits of what is possible for us to be able to discover and that we're going to need another so when we had that flurry of discoveries and you saw all of the announcements that we made with Hamea and Makemake and all these other ones that they had turned up that was because new telescopes had come online new techniques and that by then going to they they used they exhausted the plane of the ecliptic looking for all these objects and it's only going to be when that next round of surveys capable of of examining the the plane of the ecliptic at higher detail you're going to have another deluge of these of these discoveries and so i i, I totally get that that there's you you always see and i you know we, we love to report on these clever missions you're like oh they figured out how to to detect the atmospheres of an extrasolar planet by bouncing the light waves off a glass of water in the middle of their mess hall but but it, sometimes it does require the big the big machines and i'm sure this is this existential question that all of the fields of science are having was like you know building particle colliders kimberly so I'm going to play the devil's advocate and go for the other side of the argument here. Uh, and my argument is twofold for the maybe we should be going more but smaller is one, it's a resources problem. And I'm sure, Paul, that you're very familiar with this. The uh, this telescope availability and the competitiveness to actually apply for and receive telescope time is getting more and more restrictive. There are more people wanting to apply for more time and the telescopes, we're not, they're not getting, we're not getting more telescopes. We're actually getting fewer telescopes and more restricted time as the years go by. It's harder and harder to actually access the telescopes we already have. So maybe we should be getting more so that we can have uh, more information, more data, more people having access to those resources. And two, I would say there is an incredible value in starting to increase the statistics in the types of and the types of objects we're observing and the number of observations of these objects that we can get. And I think there's no more perfect argument for that than the Kepler Space Telescope, which 
revolutionized exoplanets in giving us those kinds of statistics, whereas before we were getting one by one uh, observations of planets. Now we have statistical arguments of what kinds of planets are more likely to form, more probable to form, so that when we do get something flagship, we, we know what to look for and what to pinpoint at. So that, that's my argument for more and smaller. I mean, yes, there is a need to get new technology and innovate and to access realms of the science and the data that we haven't been getting before to get that new information and to fill in those gaps. But there's still an incredible power of letting the astronomers that we have in the next generation of astronomers, which is even bigger than the, than current, than the current uh, number of people that we have, getting those people looking at new data and giving them the opportunity to try. I'm actually, I think, more sympathetic to sort of mega projects in astronomy than I am in planetary science, because you build a great telescope like James Webb, and you can do a little bit of everything with it. You can point it at uh, an exoplanet and measure its atmosphere. You can point it at a distant galaxy and get its spectrum. You can point it at a planet and use that to measure its, its heat distribution. And so you can invest in these really pricey tools and there's at least a little bit of application for everybody. But if you send a $4 billion spacecraft to Europa, that does nothing for you at Saturn or at Uranus or at Neptune. If you send a $3 billion rover to Mars, you're, you learn nothing about Venus. You have no opportunity to learn anything else. And so I, I think there's an interesting difference between we often lump astronomy and planetary science together, but in, in this respect, I think there's an interesting difference between how you have to look at these big missions. I mean, even the fairly low power camera attached to the Juno mission has been wildly successful in delivering pretty images of Jupiter. And I'm sure people are figuring out tricks to use it for science, to map out the storms on Jupiter and things like that. Like it wasn't intended necessarily for science and is getting used. I'm sure it will get used for science because somebody's like, the data's in there. I'm going to be able to get it. So there's definitely, it's like you need to be able to count on the creativity of researchers to be able to pull out the data that they require from it. I don't know. Paul? Uh, it's, it's a really tough problem. And... I'm glad this article appeared because I think we internally as a community aren't talking about it enough. It comes up, there's this other thing that happens in astronomy called the decadal survey, where every 10 years, basically all the astronomers and astrophysicists in the world get together and decide on what are our priorities for the next 10 years. What do we want to know in what fields, in what areas, and you know, how much money do we want to spend? It's not like, it's not saying like, this is exactly what we're going to do for the next 10 years, but it's setting our priorities. And that process is of course, horribly broken and bureaucratic and mismanaged and full of bias and all the usual uh, human elements. It's a natural response to the the lack and decreasing amount of funding that we're seeing over the past few decades where, okay, we're, we don't have a lot of money to play with. So we got to prioritize. And that entire process lends itself to things that are, are popular, things that are, are sexy in the community that everyone agrees we want to work on. And yeah, if we want to blow $5 billion to pin down dark and the value of dark energy to 1% uncertainty, like then that's what we're going to do, but we're going to leave a lot of other things behind. And I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what the correct answer is. There probably is no correct answer, but we, I think we need to talk about it more. Well, uh, I guess that'll be an ongoing conversation. I mean, I really think that every science, you know, all of the sciences are having similar conversations as they're reaching the limits of what some tinkerer in their garage can can do. We've the time of this sort of uh, the gentleman 
uh, scientist back in the seventeen hundreds. The gentle woman scientist gentle back in the in the seventeen hundreds. Gentle person. Yeah, the the Mary Curies out there who could just like you know futz around with uh, with radioactive material and make and enormous discoveries. Well, and die horribly, but that was her choice. But the point being that the, that they have that available to them now. You do need the big instruments to make the fundamental discoveries, right? That's just I'd like to make one one last point on that. We feel like, it, you're absolutely right, that, that we feel like in order to make the next leap, we have to invest in the giant atom smashers, the giant telescopes, the giant missions, the giant computers. But that's because we're on a particular research path as a community. There are countless questions we could ask and answers we could seek if 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 all of a sudden everyone in the world decide we're no we're not going to have giant atom smashers anymore, just no more ever again. Well, particle physicists wouldn't necessarily be out of work. There's so many other questions that we could be asking and could be researching with smaller equipment with smaller budgets, but we simply don't. So you think you think they're lazy. It's not, it's not. Uh, or greedy. Okay. Or greedy. It's no, not but... necessarily like greedy or lazy. It's no. like, uh, we're not necessarily constricted to this path where we have to go to more expensive, larger missions in order to answer scientific questions in our particular field. Right. Whenever you, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so there's one last story I just wanted to quickly touch on, and this was big congratulations to Rocket Lab this weekend, last weekend, for launching their Electron rocket. And this took off from New Zealand, and it's an American com company, but it launched from New Zealand. The rocket is teeny tiny. I think it's 18 meters tall. Uh, has huge chunks of it are completely 3D printed, and the thing blasted off. This was their second test. The first one was called It's Just a Test. I think this one was called Skill Testing, <laughs> <laughs> which I love. Well and, done. Yeah, and, um, and, uh, and it achieved orbit and was able to put three uh, tiny satellites into orbit. And the one that's most interesting to me is this thing they call, they're calling the humanity sphere. And it is a disco ball that is nice. going to go around. What? Yeah, it's a disco ball. It's about, I mean, I guess it was very small when it was when it was packaged up, but then it sort of expanded as much larger ball. And it is, um, you know, about human size, human height. And, it, but it's a, it looks like a dodecahedron, you know, like play some, some Dungeons and Dragons with it. But what's great about it is it, it will then tumble through space and it will reflect the sunlight and very well because it's very reflective and it's got these facets. So it'll be like iridium, like like how you can see iridium flares. It's going to be this this ball that's going around. It's going to last. Space disco ball. Space disco ball. It's going to last yeah. for about nine months. and Did then they provide a soundtrack? I don't, I don't know. You can bring your own. But it's going to last. That would be a great idea, though. Um, and then it's going to last about nine months, and then it's going to uh, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. So you're going to have about nine months. The, the, and they've got a I'll website. Get my platform that, shoes out of storage. <laughs> they've got a website you can go to, and you can get some predictions on when it's going to pass over your part of the world. But the way they orbited it, for, the, the way they launched it from New Zealand, it might take a while. Uh, one of our viewers was in the east coast of the United States and didn't get a uh, a close flyby for over 2,200 hours. So. So it's going to be a while before we may get a chance to see this thing. But uh, yeah, there you go. Someone is someone posted a picture of it in the see, in the I, chat. I think that's really exciting. Like, imagine a world where we said, "Okay, no more big rockets." What would we do? You know, we would still want to solve problems and answer scientific questions, and we'd have to come up with some pretty creative solutions. Well, and the like rocket itself ball. is is quite interesting, and I highly recommend. Speaking of Scott Manley, um, he did a great breakdown of why this rocket is actually quite different than than other rockets. A big part is the fact that it's 3D printed, and the other part is that it's got an electric 
essentially got an electric system for pumping the fuel. It ran with kerosene and oxygen, but it actually had a different way that it ran its pumps. It was very efficient and, and quite interesting and had never been done before. And the 3D printing was a big part of being able to produce this rocket. So kudos to the folks at, uh, at Rocket Lab for getting their electron into orbit. It sounds like it's going to be a fairly inexpensive way. I think, you know, we at we together with with our fans could probably get a satellite launched with a reasonably sized Kickstarter, our own super yeah. disco ball. So I think it's uh... we should do that. <laughs> I want or, one. I or want it. A space tel. How about a space tel? How about we get a space tel telescope developed and then give as much time as we can to uh, to all of the astronomers. Can we there. launch your car into orbit? It's that so five hundred kilogram payload limit. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I hope you drive a mini. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not my car. Um. All right. Well, I think it's time to wrap things up. But we are like just a little bit organized this week. Oh, actually, well, you know what? It's time for the interview. No. Let's do the interview first. Oh yeah. And there's our interview. <gasps> All right, uh, as we mentioned before the interview, uh, we got a little bit creative this week, a little more prepared. Someone had recommended what's gonna happen this week in space. Uh, Kimberly, you looked up what's gonna happen this week in space, right? Oh no, Morgan looked it up. He was, he was way on top oh, of it. Oh, Morgan, found what'd you find? Awesome place to look for it. Yeah, I found out that 32 years ago today, uh, the Voyager 2 spacecraft made our first and only encounter with the planet Uranus. Flew by in Ooh. just a few hours after a nine year journey and was on its way to Neptune. Yay. Yay. Planet flyby. That works. We should if go back. Seen, if you've seen a picture of Uranus, it's a picture that was taken on this day 32 years ago, guaranteed. That's cool. Man, I want some new photos. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we really gotta go <laughs> yeah. back. Uh, one person who did a great job uh, is Jason Major, who is one of my favorite astro, um, Photoshop Raiders, and he goes and takes all of this data from various missions and processes them in Photoshop, did a great job of of looking at this and has done other stuff on Juno and stuff from Curiosity, so go check that out. All right, time to wrap things up. Uh, Kimberly, what are you working on? Where can people find out more? Oh, so you can always find out more uh, by following me on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. Uh, all of my science writing is on eos.org. That's eos.org. And actually, just this morning, uh, I, speaking of large space telescopes, uh, while I was at AAS, uh, the astronomy meeting a few weeks ago, I asked a bunch of exoplanet people what uh, exo large exoplanet mission they were most looking forward to in the coming years. And then I wrote an article about it. So check that out. Just published today. So have fun. And you're not going to tell us what it is. Perfect. I'm not going to tell no. you, but it's no surprise which one took the, took the prize. All right, it's no surprise, <laughs> James. James Webb. Morgan. Yeah, I threw up some new charts on my website, chartyourworld.org, this week, focusing on food. No surprise, but every continent in the last 50 years has been eating more, basically steadily. <laughs> the only content even continent even to time. even try to moderate their intake has been Europe, and they dropped around 1990, but are pretty much back up to where they left off. So enjoy those you were potato say chips. Antarctica. And uh, otherwise you can uh, see what I've been working on over at morganrenberg.com. Paul. Hey, you can see everything I do over on my website, pmsutter.com. That has links to Space Radio, Ask a Spaceman, uh, all my articles and even Astro Tours. And I have to say, no joke, the Atacama trip that's going to Northern Chile this December, we have two spots left as of this moment. Just two. Just two. So if you're kind of interested, you need to stop being kind of interested and actually sign up. Otherwise you're gonna lose your space. Right on. Uh, all right, and of course I'm publisher of Universe Today. The thing that I've been doing is I've been doing a weekly newsletter. I've been having a lot of fun going back to my roots and writing what's going on in space every every week by hand. So uh, it's like an email newsletter, an email newsletter, old school. That's how Universe Today got started. And then I let robots take over and they messed it up. And so now I'm taking control from the robots again and writing it by hand. So the robots are going to come after fighting, you. fighting the good fight. <laughs> right, exactly. All right. Well, now you it's should time. buy robot insurance. And now it's time to say goodbye.
Whoa, that's weird. There we go. Thanks, everyone, for watching this week. Thanks to our special guest, Paul. Thanks to the WSH crew for joining us, as always. We will see you all next week. Everyone does the queen wave. Yeah, I've been watching The Crown, so I'm... There you go. All right, see you later, everyone.